Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel, or if you're new here, hi, welcome, my name's Georgia, and on my platforms here on the internet, I focus on unsolved true crime. Today, I want to share with you the details of a group of unsolved murders committed across the USA between October 1978 and 1992. You could probably refer to this as an unsolved serial killer case, as it is believed that these all may have been committed by the same unidentified male. The murders here occurred across West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Mississippi, Kentucky, Arkansas and Tennessee, with the body of each victim being found abandoned alongside a major highway. And as is the case in a lot of serial killing cases, it is believed that many of the victims were hitchhiking prior to their deaths. Whilst all the victims do tend to vary in terms of age, height, appearance and state, there are some pretty solid similarities as well, like the fact that each and every victim had red hair. These are the redhead murders, or you may have heard this case also referred to as the Bible Belt Strangler, due to the bodies all being found in the American Bible Belt. There are a wide array of victims in this case, five of whom are solidly considered to be linked, whilst many others are much more tenuous. Sources do state there are up to 14 women who could be victims of this same killer. And regardless, we are going to talk about all confirmed and just suspected victims in today's episode, because either way, whether or not they are the victim of the same killer, they all deserve justice for their murders, no matter who committed them. This episode is just going to be a lot of different names being thrown at you, but I'm going to try and keep it as interesting and informational as possible. There's really not much of a sort of storyline I can follow in this case. There are just a lot of victims. So we're going to start with the confirmed victims here, beginning with 28-year-old Lisa Nichols, who was discovered on September 16th, 1984, alongside Interstate 40 near West Memphis in Arkansas. As I'm sure you all know by now, I do love to share with you details about the victims, who they were in life, their likes, their loves, their personality, but sadly, that's not always possible. I don't have loads to tell you about Lisa because it seems she was estranged from her family. They've never spoken to the media about her death or about her life, as far as I could find, and neither has anyone else who knew her, so there really isn't much I can tell you about who she was. When Lisa's body was found by a hitchhiker next to the exit ramp of Interstate 40, it was very clear that she'd been there for a minute. Her body was already beginning to decompose. Once again, the actual details about her case are few and far between on the internet, so I can't tell you loads of information about the investigation here, apart from the fact that her body had been brutalised and she was wearing only the remnant of a knit top when she was found. Her cause of death was strangulation. After her discovery, Lisa remained unidentified for nine months and she was eventually reunited with her name in 1985, when fingerprints led investigators to the name Lisa Nichols. She was a local transient sex worker who was known on the streets as Baby Doll, but she also went by the name of Lisa Jarvis. A member of the Metro Police Vice Squad in Nashville told the state paper, The Tennessean, her rap sheet stretches from the ceiling to the floor three times feeling as always. Lisa would be the only victim identified at the time of her discovery, or at least within a year of her discovery. The rest of the potential victims of this redhead murderer remained unidentified for decades, likely due to the fact that they were mostly all estranged from their family, or they weren't native in the states they were found. It was much harder to spread the word of cases like this in a time before social media. The news would sort of tend to spread locally, but not nationally. After her identification, investigators said they had a very hard time locating Lisa's family. It was believed that she did have siblings somewhere in West Virginia where they knew she was originally from, but when they did eventually notify her brothers, neither of them showed up to claim her body. But now they had her name at least, investigators were able to get in contact with her pimp, who told them that he'd last seen Lisa climb into a semi-truck outside a truck stop in Shearerville in Arkansas, and this was just four days before her body was discovered. The autopsy concluded that she'd been murdered within 24 hours of this. By the time that Lisa was identified, so nine months after her discovery, her case had already been tied to a possible serial killer because multiple other victims had been found. An article in the Courier Journal from June 1985 reads, 
Police have said eight slayings in five states, including Kentucky and Tennessee, may have been committed by the same person. The Tennessee Bureau of Investigation has included Miss Nichols on a list of possible serial killing victims. And the list of these possible serial killer victims all had something in common. They all had red hair. On January 1st, 1985, the body of Tina Farmer was found, bound and wrapped in a blanket, down an embankment of the south side of Interstate 75 in Jellicoe, Tennessee. She was wearing a tan pullover and blue jeans, and she was found fully clothed. She was said to be in an advanced state of decomposition, despite it being thought that she was murdered via strangulation just 72 hours before she was found. Tina remained unidentified for decades after she was found, and her case was actually solved through a blog post. In 2018, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation was made aware of a blog that focused on missing persons cases, one of which was Tina Farmers, and they found that she matched the description of the unidentified woman found in Campbell County decades before. An intelligence analyst was able to track down a fingerprint card of Tina's from the early 1980s, which they then compared against the post-mortem prints of the Campbell County Jane Doe, and what would you know, it was a match. Tina Farmer was just 21 or 22 years old at the time of her death and a native of Indiana. She'd last been seen accompanied by a trucker in Indianapolis and her family had reported her as missing at the time of her disappearance. But at this time, Indiana didn't have any law requiring unidentified victims or missing people to be entered into a database. Hence the connection between Tina and the Jane Doe not being made until decades later. At the time of her death, Tina was pregnant, some sources say just 10 to 12 weeks, some say 5 months, but her family say that she had had another daughter prior to her disappearance. Now what might be shocking to hear is that there actually have been some answers in Tina's case, this is technically solved. In 2019, DNA evidence made a link between Tina and Jerry Leon Johns, a truck driver from Cleveland, Tennessee, and he'd already long been considered a suspect in the Redhead Murders case by this point. He'd been arrested in March 1985 for the abduction and attempted murder of a woman in Knoxville. Linda Shack was the woman in question. She'd been left for dead inside a storm drain under Interstate 14 near Watch Road, and she'd been choked with a piece of cloth ripped from her t-shirt and bound. Miraculously, Linda survived. The knot in the cloth used on Linda was said to be very similar to the knot in a piece of material found tied around the neck of the next victim I'm gonna talk about. So that, plus the location that she was left in, made Jerry Johns a very obvious suspect. When Linda was recovered, she quickly led investigators to Johns. The pair had met at the Catch One Club where Linda worked, and they went back to Johns' hotel room that night, where he pulled a gun on her, claiming to be a narcotics officer with the Texas Rangers. Johns was very quickly arrested after this, where he was questioned at length by the authorities about 20 unsolved murders across the Bible Belt. He was apparently very intelligent and seemed to revel in the thought of being a serial killer. From his prison cell, he gave an interview to the new Sentinel, saying, Apparently I fit the mould of what they were looking for. You can't blame them, they've got a lot of unsolved cases all over the country. But they can try all they want, it won't work. I didn't do it. But he definitely did do it to Linda. He was found guilty of aggravated kidnapping and assault with intent to commit murder in 1989, but they could never find enough to link him to any other homicide. At least that's until Tina was identified and DNA tech advanced enough to make the link to her murder. In 2016, Tennessee Bureau of Investigation Special Agent Brandon Elkins resubmitted crime scene evidence for modern DNA testing, and they were able to detect semen on both Tina's clothing and the blanket her body was wrapped in. As we can guess, the DNA profile matched Jerry John's. But John's had actually already died in prison in December 2015, so true justice couldn't be obtained for Tina. There couldn't be a trial. But a Campbell County grand jury did convene and they found that if Johns was still alive, he would be indicted on a charge of first degree murder in Tina's death. And that's the most that you can get after the fact like this. 
Now you would think, seeing as Tina is linked to the other four solid victims in the Redhead Murders case, it would make sense that Johns was clearly linked to them as well, but that's not really how it works, because this case is still sort of hypothetical, it's all alleged, and apart from Tina, these are all unsolved homicides. Just because he's been found guilty, or he would be found guilty of Tina's murder, it doesn't mean 100% that he's guilty of the rest, although you would think that's kind of how it works. This is a theory. The redhead murders is a theory at the end of the day. It's not anything solid. We don't know that the same person was responsible for all these murders. On March 31st, 1985, another body was discovered by mile markers 29 and 30 on Interstate 24 in Pleasant View, Tennessee, by a couple who pulled over because their car radiator was playing up. They wandered into the woods to find water and they came across a skull. The remains they found were completely skeletonized, and it was believed that the victim had died three to five months beforehand from an unknown cause. A cause of death could never be established here, but it was clear that this was yet another red-headed woman. A few strands of red hair was found on the skull. This woman was also fully clothed and was further linked because of the aforementioned piece of cloth tied around her neck. The knot here being very similar to the one used in Linda's case, which is another potential link to John's. This victim remained unidentified for 38 years until in July 2023, Othram were able to identify her as 23-year-old Michelle LeVon Inman, a native of Nashville, Tennessee. According to the Tennessean, Michelle's brother told agents that he'd not heard from his sister in more than four decades, and investigators were able to pinpoint the last contact the family had with her around December 1984, and then she was found at the end of March, so it did match up with the months it was speculated that a body had been by the interstate. Investigators have released images of the shirt Michelle was wearing at the time of her death. It was a white button-up with what looks like pink floral details and cord detail on the front in sort of like a western style, I'd say. A hat was also found at the scene. It's blue with a sort of sunset scene on the top. It's not clear if this was just found at the scene or if Michelle was thought to be wearing it at the time of her death. Investigators are asking anyone who recognises either piece of these clothing to come forward. Obviously, with Michelle being so freshly identified just three months ago, they are really sort of actively looking into her death and following up on any new leads that are coming in. So if you know anything, if you knew Michelle in life, please contact the authorities. If you have any knowledge about her homicide, specifically about the people that Michelle may have been with in the weeks before her death, they're asking that you call the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation at 1-800-TBI-FIND, or you can send an email to tbi.coldcase at tbi.tn.gov. The very next day after Michelle's body was found on April 1st, another body was found, this time in Gray, Knox County, Tennessee, along Route 25, and she was identified in 2018 as SB Regina Black Pilgrim of North Carolina. SB was found in a large white Admiral refrigerator, and for many years she would only be known as Kentucky Jane Doe, as there was no clue at all as to her identity. All they knew is that, like the rest, she had red hair. Espy's cause of death was established to be suffocation, but very interestingly, the coroner could find no marks on her body, no signs that she'd been asphyxiated or strangled. It has long been speculated that Espy had actually been able to escape from her attacker, that she fleed into the woods unclothed and found an abandoned refrigerator to hide from her attacker in. But when she got inside the refrigerator, she found herself trapped and she suffocated to death. Now, the coroner at the time didn't conduct any testing on the fridge itself to determine whether or not the seal was tight enough to cause this, so this does remain simply a theory, but it could explain the lack of marks on her body. However, there was also a very clear footprint at the scene, which could be that of her attacker. SB may have been last seen soliciting a ride from North Carolina through CB radio. SB had five children, the youngest of whom Elizabeth was just six years old when she disappeared, and it was through these children that she was eventually identified. They saw a social media post online about the Kentucky Jane Doe and wondered if it could be their mother. I must admit, the 2017 reconstruction by Carl Koppelman does bear quite a likeness. Elizabeth came forward and offered her DNA for comparison, and it was a match. 
On October 1st, 2018, it was confirmed that SB, the Kentucky Jane Doe, was her mother. Don't underestimate the power of social media, guys, of sharing these images and this information. You never know who might just see it. This is a perfect example. Just two days after Espy's discovery in 1985, on April 3rd, more skeletonized remains were found by a hunter about 200 yards off Big Wheel Gap Road in Jellicoe, Tennessee. Remember, Jellicoe was also where Tina Farmer had been discovered just four months earlier. This time, only partial remains were found, a skull and 32 bones, and it was believed that the victim had died anywhere from one month to four years earlier. Due to the length of time here, her hair colour wasn't actually known at the time of discovery, and the medical examiner estimated her age between 9 and 15 years old, so much younger than the other victims, and so she was nicknamed Baby Girl. A forensic analysis at the time determined that it was very unlikely she was from Tennessee originally and she may have came from the Midwest. When in August 2022, Othram were able to identify her as 15-year-old Tracy Walker, it was confirmed that she came from Indiana. Tracy had disappeared in 1978, her mother reported her as running away from their home in Lafayette. She was last seen at Tippecanoe Mall with a friend. This means that Tracy may have been dead for about six years by the point she was found, putting her time of death way before the rest of the victims that I've mentioned. Only after her identification was it confirmed that she had red hair, and I couldn't find confirmation if her death had been connected to the redhead murders before this point. I do suspect that it hadn't, but I'm not able to say for sure. But nowadays, her name is definitely on the list. So these five women, Lisa Nichols, Tina Farmer, Tracy Walker, Michelle Inman and S.B. Pilgrim are all considered to be linked to the redhead murders, all victims of the same unidentified serial killer. But as I mentioned earlier, there are many more victims who may come under the same umbrella. On May 25th, 1981, the body of Karen K. Nippers was recovered from a low water crossing on Highway MM near Dixon, Missouri. For 40 years, she had been known as the Pulaski County Jane Doe, before being tentatively identified by the DNA Doe Project in December 2019, but it does seem pretty foolproof. I don't know why they're saying it's tentative. A possible relative came forward who led them to Karen's brother, who shared with investigators that his family had lost contact with his sister in the early 1980s. They analysed samples from Karen and the brother and found that they were 19.4 million times more likely to be biological siblings than not. So it seems pretty certain. Jane Doe is Karen. At the time of her death, Karen lived in the St. Louis area, but it's not known why she was in Pulaski County. She may well have been killed elsewhere and then just dumped here. She was married to Harold Sturgill from Indiana. What we know about Karen's death is her cause of death was strangulation, a pair of pantyhose was found tied around her neck, her clothes looked as if they'd been put on in a hurry and her jean pockets were pulled out as if somebody had been intentionally emptying them. Although there were no sort of obvious signs of sexual assault, she did have mild trauma to her vaginal walls and her panties were found bunched up. On February 3rd, 1983, another victim was found by an elderly couple alongside Route 520 near Littleton, Wetzel County, West Virginia, in an area that was known for illegal trash disposal. She was naked and clearly had been placed there very recently, because there was snow on the ground around her body and underneath her, but not yet on the body. She hadn't died in the spot in which she was found, there were tyre and footprints in the snow showing that she'd been placed there after her death. To this day, the victim has not been identified and remains known as the Wetzel County Jane Doe. The autopsy wasn't able to determine a cause of death, but she had died about two days before being placed in this spot, and she had not been the victim of sexual assault, or at least as far as they could tell. There was also no evidence at all of a struggle in general. They couldn't find any problems with the victim's organs, nothing on the outside of her body. Investigators kind of just presumed this was a homicide based on the circumstances of her discovery, the place where her body was found, but nothing on the body points to that. Strangulation, the cause of death in most of the other cases, is actually ruled out here due to the lack of ligature marks or bruising on the neck. Suffocation, however, could not be excluded. I mean, you can quite easily cover somebody's mouth and leave no marks behind. 
Jane Dial had medium length auburn hair and likely brown eyes. She was 5 foot 5 to 5 foot 6 and about 135 pounds. She had two scars including one from a cesarean section so she had had a baby before. Her legs and underarms were both shaven which is very important to know because if she were a hitchhiker that likely wouldn't be the case so she probably wasn't a hitchhiker. As well as this, Jane Doe had double pierced ears, she had orange painted toenails and her blood type was B. Her dentals are available and specifically she had an upper denture fitted within eight weeks before her death. So this is somebody who cared about her dental health. Again, she probably wasn't homeless, she probably wasn't transient. She had somewhere to go to get dental work and pretty serious dental work at that. And although it is disputed, it does seem as if they do have DNA for comparison, so I'll be very interested to see if they're doing anything with that. Investigators were able to find possible witnesses in the area and subjected them to hypnosis, which led to West Virginia State Police troopers looking for a white male in his 40s, described as stocky and about 5 foot 10. He may have driven a 1978-1980 Chevrolet two-toned brown pickup truck, possibly with a lighter coloured camper top. This man was seen in the area where Jane Doe was found, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he was responsible for her death, but he was definitely there. According to Doe Network, there is an additional suspect in this case who's already in prison for life without parole, but he can't be prosecuted in this case until the Jane Doe is identified. Now, despite searching, I couldn't find any further details about this. I do wonder if this is in reference to Jerry Johns, but that is just speculation on my behalf. Maybe it hasn't been updated since his death. A year later, another woman was found adjacent to Highway 78 in Olive Branch, DeSoto County, Mississippi. Also still unidentified, she's known as the DeSoto County Jane Doe. Now her body was found in still recognisable condition. She was white, 20 to 35 years old, 5 foot 2 to 5 foot 4 and 110 pounds. So she was very petite with red or strawberry blonde hair. Her eye colour is undetermined. In terms of distinguishing marks, she had scars on her left arm and hand, a tattoo of THC on her right ankle, or REJ or RET on her left ankle. Jane Doe was a heavy smoker, she bit her fingernails and had had surgery before, once on her left forearm and she'd also had tubal ligation, she'd had her tubes tied. Jane Doe was found wearing a short sleeve pullover top with Gloria Vanderbilt jeans. She wasn't wearing panties, socks, shoes, jewellery or a bra, none of which were found nearby. The autopsy revealed that she may have been sexually assaulted and her cause of death was established to be asphyxiation by ligature strangulation. Her death was ruled a homicide. The FBI released a request for information asking if anyone was aware of a female who went missing after the 1985 New Year, a woman who was very nervous, smoked and matched the victim's description. If you know anything, you're asked to contact Chief Inspector Roger Hutchins at the DeSoto County Sheriff's Office at 662-468-8521. Our next victim was found on March 29th, 1985. So this is right in the midst of the sort of confirmed victims of the redhead killer now. And she was identified in 2012 by DNA and dental records as Priscilla Ann Blevins. Priscilla's skeletal remains were found alongside Interstate 40 in Waynesville, North Carolina. And her cause of death has never been confirmed by authorities. Nor have they confirmed whether or not Priscilla's case is actually considered to be a homicide or not. It seems this case has been linked by the public purely because of the location of her body next to an interstate and the fact that she did also have reddish hair. Priscilla had gone missing a whole decade before she was found in 1975 at the age of 27. On April 14th, 1985, the body of Elizabeth Lamotte was found in Greenville, Green County, Tennessee. She was in an advanced stage of decomposition when she was found and it was determined that she'd been killed three to six weeks beforehand, her cause of death being a bit different with severe blunt force trauma and a potential stab wound. Elizabeth had been six to eight weeks pregnant before she died but she had miscarried shortly before so she hadn't miscarried as a result of her death, it had already happened. 
Elizabeth ran away from a family home on April 6th, 1984, and was last seen aged 17 on November 22nd. She had been placed at a youth development centre in Manchester, and she left the facility that day on a furlough to Gill Stadium. She never returned, but wasn't reported as missing until 2017. Five months after her disappearance, she was found over 900 miles away in Tennessee, but of course, no one knew who she was. Elizabeth was unidentified for over 20 years before she was eventually identified in November 2018. The way they came across her identity was actually quite fascinating. So a while ago, I covered the case of the Bearbrook murders, referring to murder victims found in barrels at Bearbrook State Park in Allenstown, New Hampshire, discovered in 1985 and 2000. This is an absolute spider web of a case, it's very convoluted, but basically three of the victims, so a mother and two daughters, have been identified, leaving a fourth, an unidentified child, without a name. She is not the biological daughter of the mother and no one knows where this child came from. However, she is the biological child of Terry Rasmussen, the man thought to be responsible for their murders. Now, Rasmussen is thought to be responsible for many more than just the four homicide victims found at Bearbrook, and he's also known to have moved across the country using a variety of aliases, including Robert or Bob Evans. An unidentified girlfriend or wife of Bob was known to be called Elizabeth Evans, and in 2017, with the Bearbrook case really coming to light, the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit asked for help from the public in identifying anyone involved in this crazy convoluted story, including Elizabeth Evans. One of the tips that came in from the public was regarding Elizabeth Lamott, who disappeared from local Manchester in this same time period. She had escaped from the Youth Development Centre and she'd never been heard from again. It was only at this point that the authorities became aware of her disappearance, entering her information into the National Crime Information Centre database as a missing person, finally after all these years. Elizabeth's two brothers provided DNA samples that were submitted to NamUs, and on November 13th, 2018, the Manchester Police Department said they'd matched the brothers' DNA to the remains of a woman found murdered in Tennessee in 1985. Analysing this timeline, she couldn't possibly have been Elizabeth Evans, but now the Lamotte family had a little bit of closure, although no answers as to her murder. On April 30th, 1985, the skeletal remains of another red-headed woman was found in Wrightsville, Pulaski County, Arkansas, and to this day, she remains unidentified. She was estimated to be about 30 to 40 years old and 5 foot 3 tall. Jane Doe had previously broken her left femur and her dental work information is available on Doe Network. Now, I don't claim to understand dental language, but it does seem that in the list of her teeth, there's a lot of them decayed and or missing. Jane Doe was found a quarter of a mile south of Wrightsville Park Road near the Arkansas River. She was not next to the interstate, so I can only assume she was linked to this case through the red hair and nothing else. And then there's over a two year gap in the timeline before the Roan County Jane Doe was discovered on August 29th, 1987 in Roan County, Tennessee. Her cause of death is unknown because her remains had been burned, presumably in an attempt to dispose of them or to obscure her identity, and they were successful, clearly, with the latter. Jane Doe is estimated to be 35 to 50 years old, white, 5 foot, 5 foot 8, with naturally brown hair that had been dyed reddish. She had a number of distinguishing features. She had breast implants, she had previously had a hysterectomy and a tracheotomy, which is an incision on the front of the neck that can serve as an airway or a site for a trach to help someone breathe. She also had an old gunshot wound to the third thoracic vertebrae, so like the top middle of her spine. She had a 22 caliber bullet lodged against her spine. This woman, whoever she was, had lived one hell of a life and she clearly spent a decent amount of time in the hospital in her time. Her dentals are available with it being noted that nicotine staining on her teeth indicates that she was a smoker. Her fingerprints are not available but her DNA is. In late 1988, the body of Stacey Lynch Horsky was found on the east side of northbound Interstate 59 near Rising Fawn in Dade County, Georgia. She had been strangled and sexually assaulted, all of which matches the MO of the redhead killer. 
Although Stacey was reported as missing by her mother in January 1989, just four months after she lost contact with her family, no connection was made with the body found in Rising Fawn, as she remained unidentified until March 2022, when she was identified with assistance from, of course, Othram. She had told her mother that she planned to hitchhike from North Carolina, where she was currently staying, back to her home state of Michigan, but she never arrived and somehow ended up in Georgia. At some point along the journey, she came across her killer, and like the rest, Stacy had red hair. But Stacy is actually the second victim today whose killer has been apprehended. In September 2022, her killer was identified as Henry Frederick Wise, also known as Hoss Wise. He was a truck driver for a Western Carolina trucking company. Investigators were able to find DNA from an unknown male who was immediately suspected to be responsible for Stacy's death. And after successfully identifying her, their next job became identifying him. Once again, Othram to the rescue, they were able to successfully produce a DNA profile and from there they found the name Henry Wise. Investigators interviewed potential family and obtained DNA swabs for comparison to confirm it was definitely him. Once they had Wise's name, he became the prime suspect. I couldn't find specific information about what this DNA was, how they found it on her body. I can only presume it was something very damning. He would have been 34 years old at the time of Stacey's murder, but he was killed in a car accident at Myrtle Beach Speedway in South Carolina in 1999, and he burned to death. So there is no justice to be had here. Wise had a long criminal history in Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina, everything ranging from theft to assault to obstruction of a police officer. Wise remains a prime suspect here. It doesn't look like they have convened a grand jury here like they did in Tina Farmer's case with Jerry Johns, but it's sort of as close as they're gonna get. I couldn't find anything linking Wise to any of the other cases here, but the fact that his trucking route did take him along a number of the interstates where victims would later be found. The final victim on this very long list is Donna Sue Nelton, who was known for years as Benton County Jane Doe, after she was found murdered on May 7th, 1990 in Rogers, Arkansas. Her remains were found off Highway 102, with several bones being recovered from the scene, alongside shotgun cladding and buckshot pellets. After the discovery, neighbours came forward to report seeing a fire in this area in February that same year, but they didn't sort of look into it any further, believing that it was just somebody in the area burning rubbish. But it seems that these remains had been set on fire after being run over with a vehicle to prevent identification. It was very, very similar to the Roan County Jane Doe, who had also been burned. At the time, there were insufficient remains for a proper reconstruction, let alone any sort of identification, but she was identified in October 2022 by Othram as Donna Nelton. Donna had last been seen in the autumn of 1989, and federal authorities do suspect her boyfriend, George Alvin Bruton, in her murder. He was not a great guy, to say the least. He'd previously spent time on the FBI Most Wanted list after taking two families hostage and wounding an officer in Utah. In 1989, he and another person had been seen disposing of rubbish bags containing Donna's personal belongings into a dumpster in North Kansas City. Her car was then found in the storage unit under his name. It was all very, very suspicious. However, Bruton had been sentenced to life in prison for drug-related offences at some point after this, and he ended up dying in prison in 2008. So again, a very strong suspect, definitely somebody who required questioning, but avoiding justice via his death. It's very frustrating. This part of the video is usually where I'd go into the investigation sort of as a whole, but the investigation here was quite bitty. Obviously, individual investigations were done for each victim to varying degrees, but there was nothing really overall. In 1985, following Elizabeth Lamont's discovery, a number of states, including Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Arkansas, Kentucky, and Mississippi, requested assistance from the FBI. They needed the Federal Bureau's help, as there was a very limited amount they could do themselves, especially between all the state lines. They knew there were potential links between cases that were popping up, but there were just so many inconsistencies. 
It was whether or not the victims had been sexually assaulted, their state of dress, the physical conditions of their body. Like S.B. Pilgrim was found in a fridge, Tina Farmer was found wrapped in a blanket, most bodies were just abandoned, they knew there were potential links in the red-headedness of it all, but they couldn't really piece it together because it's so difficult to do with all these different agencies. They needed sort of an over-branching agency to look at it all, so the FBI was the obvious choice. In April 1985, 21 officials from five states met in a conference with the FBI, where they looked at further four potential victims found in Texas and another victim found in Ohio in 1981, who at the time was nicknamed Buckskin Girl, and she was later identified as Marsha King. But all of these were ultimately ruled out as possible victims of the redhead murder. At this conference, Steve Watson, the deputy director of the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation said, while there are a great number of similarities in the cases, there's also a great number of dissimilarities. All were white females, but only three have red hair. The others were strawberry blonde or dark haired ladies. These people would seem to be from areas that are perhaps a considerable distance from where they were found since none have been identified. They would not tend to have a lifestyle not sufficiently tied to others who would be willing to report their being missing. So it seems at this point they were only considering like true redhead, like ginger people as redheaded victims in this case. They weren't looking at anyone with auburn or strawberry blonde hair. And they also sort of identified that none of these victims were likely from the states in which they were found, which for the most part would turn out to be right. At this same conference, the Knox County Chief of Detectives denied Jerry Johns was a suspect, having already made the link with Linda Shack's abduction. But obviously at this point in time in the mid eighties, they didn't have access to the DNA tech that we have that proved that he was at the very least responsible for Tina Farmer. Johns was one of the only names that ever came up in connection with this case and whilst we know now that he was responsible for Tina's murder and if you take the not as evidence you may be able to link him to Michelle Inman as well, we didn't know that, they didn't know that at this time. If you can link him to two victims, and three if you include Linda, it is well within reason he may have been responsible for many more as well. Other than Johns, only one other suspect has ever really been spoken about, a 32-year-old trucker in Pennsylvania who has always been unnamed. He was questioned after kidnapping and raping another young woman in Indiana who managed to escape, but he was ultimately dismissed after questioning by the Tennessee police. And that is all we've got in terms of suspects. But in 2018, when the only victim to be identified was still Lisa Nichols, an Elizabethton High School sociology class analyzed the behavior of the redhead killer over the course of an entire semester. And this was sort of relevant to them as one of the bodies was found in Greene County, Tennessee, very close by. And that personal link made the students very passionate about the project. And it seems like it was actually this group who coined the nickname the Bible Belt Strangler or the Bible Belt Killer, a name which has struck a lot of people use this name now when referring to this killer. They used criminal investigation techniques and the Doe Network site to establish that these cases were indeed linked. Of course, discussion of links between these cases had long been discussed, but without solid evidence, it was always just speculation, a theory. And it still remains that, it is still just theory, but they, they made links. The student's teacher, Alex Campbell, sent the information to an FBI profiler who actually validated the links they had made. And it looks like they even invited the students to the Knoxville FBI Bureau to present their findings to special agents. The students believed that the six victims whose cases they looked at were most likely killed by the same assailant. And they were looking at Lisa Nichols, the Wetzel County Jane Doe, Tina Farmer, Elizabeth Lamotte, Michelle Inman, and Espy Pilgrim all of whom were still unidentified at this point, apart from Lisa Nichols. Now, this is a very interesting selection of cases they chose to look at here. It wasn't the typical five in the redhead murder case, but the ones they chose were all pretty local cases. In the profile the students created, they speculated that the suspect was a male born no later than 1962, but no earlier than 1936. He was between 5'9 and 6'2 and 180 to 270 pounds. It's thought that he was a truck driver and lived in or near the Knoxville area due to all six of these murders taking place on the I-40 corridor or along I-75 and I-81. 
It's thought that he was above average IQ, right-handed and came from an unstable home. And he was also likely a mission-orientated killer. A mission-orientated killer sees his goal as eliminating an identifiable group of people, such as sex workers or young women or certain racial or religious groups. According to Psychology Today, these types of killers are rarely clinically insane. Instead, they're likely to be perfectionist and are highly compulsive. They're usually stable, gainfully employed and long-term residents of the area in which they kill. They plan their murders with great precision and kill quickly and efficiently, for example, by suffocation or asphyxiation. They fall into the category of an organised killer. It would also be highly likely that he was religious, with mission-oriented killers often believing their victims are divinely chosen for them, that this is their reason for being here on earth. And importantly, they will often not stop until they're either apprehended or killed. Or, as the high school students suspect here, they believe he probably simply stopped in this case because he stopped driving. They actually think this killer is still out there somewhere alive. Sure, this was all just a school project, but the FBI agreed with their profile and raised so much awareness of this case. I don't know if the Jane Doe's were necessarily identified on the back of all this, but I'm sure this extra awareness certainly pushed authorities to do so. But getting reunited with their identities is only half the battle here. There's no true closure until the families know what happened, who was responsible for the deaths of their loved ones. I couldn't find any information about potential suspect DNA being found at any more of the scenes. I would assume it would already be tested if there was, but I can't say for sure. Again, I want to make it clear that no one has ever been able to confirm that these cases are definitely 100% connected. The redhead murder theory is just that, it's a theory that a single person was responsible for most, if not all, of these cases and it cannot be confirmed or denied until they're able to uncover some more evidence. But linking these cases together like this is really smart. It means that you can't mention one without the other. These names are intrinsically linked forever. Awareness is tied to everyone. If or when another Jane Doe gets identified, the others will naturally be brought up in conversation, bringing them to light once again. This case does bring to mind for me some other similar serial killer cases from across the USA, like Dr. No, that was the nickname given to a suspected serial killer thought to be responsible for the murders of at least nine women and girls in Ohio between 1981 and 1990. Dr. No primarily victimized sex workers in car parks and truck stops along I-71. He's also been linked to more cases in New York, Illinois, and Pennsylvania. And in 2019, Dr. No was identified as Samuel Legg III by familial DNA. Earlier on, I mentioned Buckskin Girl. She was actually found to be a victim of Samuel Legg. Between March 1988 and April 1989, a killer known as the New Bedford Highway Killer was operating in New Bedford, Massachusetts. There are between 9 and 11 victims. All were known sex workers or had struggles with addiction. All went missing from New Bedford, but were found in surrounding towns along Route 140. And then there's the Colonial Parkway murders, in which at least eight people were found murdered along the Colonial Parkway in southeast Virginia between 1986 and 1989. This one is slightly different because all victims were taken in pairs, but it's the same time frame and similar-ish area. Maybe that last one is a slight stretch, but Tennessee and Virginia are technically neighbouring states, and you have a serial killer operating in both. I've already mentioned the link to the Bearbrook murders in this case. I don't necessarily think this is Terry Rasmussen's MO, but there is so much unknown about his life. I do assume authorities have looked into a possible connection here. I can't say that for certain, but it seems like a natural progression. If you have any information about any of the cases I've mentioned today, please don't hesitate to contact the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. The details will be in the description box down below. If you knew any of these victims in life, if you have a suspected identity for any of the Jane Doe's I've mentioned, any little tiny piece of information could be vital in this case. Who knows, there could just be one puzzle piece waiting to connect everyone. I have no doubt that at least some of these cases are connected. 
Thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm taking the time to learn about all these women, about their stories. Like I said, if you have any information, please do not hesitate to contact the authorities and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.